Welcome to Canadian Creatives, a now digital network series that showcases Canadian designers and thinkers. Our guests share their creative processes, innovative projects, and unique experiences. Here you'll find motivation and inspiration for your creative journey. We'll highlight the diverse careers, collaborations, and communities out there for creatives like you. Now, recording from the heart of Toronto and hosted by creative director Daniel Francavilla, this is Canadian Creatives. Our next guest brings together architecture, design, and community. She was raised in Vancouver, educated in Montreal, and is now based in Toronto. Her design think tank and creative agency, Architects, has worked with national nonprofits and social enterprises, focusing on education, community design, and innovation consulting. She works to bring together groups to tackle the intersection of architecture and design with social change. She also directs the Community Design Initiative, a project engaging some of Canada's most marginalized youth in architecture and design in Toronto's priority neighborhoods. She has been featured at events like Toronto Design Offsite Festival and Nuit Blanche, in national media such as the CBC and Toronto Star, and has shared her insights in her very own TEDx talk. Introducing our next Canadian creative, Zara Ibrahim. I am from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, that's where I was born. And when I was about eight months old, I moved to, well, my, I didn't move, but my family moved us to <laughs> Vancouver, BC, which is where I grew up. I think I've always been in the creative field. I think since I was probably seven years old and bedazzling my genes, I, I knew that, you know, not to characterize it, but, or not to parody or, or caricature that experience. Um, but that I always wanted to make, that the production of making and the production of sharing that making and engaging the reactions um, of, people's, uh, of people's experiences of what I, what I produce has always been a part of who I am. And I was educated at McGill and uh, took a funny path to finding that I fell in love with architecture. And uh, that path included many uh, diversions that um, go quite far from what I thought architecture was. And uh, as I started to sort of learn more and more about architecture, I learned that it incorporates almost all the things that I was looking at um, before I finally made it to that destination. So I was educated at McGill. Um, and uh, shortly after my time at McGill, I moved to Toronto and have been here ever since. The practice of design and the practice of architecture is so widely applicable. And so um, we are best, we are so well positioned to understand people and to understand the way they behave and their activities activities and their environments as designers um, because in order to create a good artifact or a good experience you have to like truly understand um, the people and that requires a, a sort of higher order empathy understanding um, or higher order of empathy and a higher level of understanding of the way that people work and you know when I when I finished studying at McGill I, I started to see that there were really two paths and one was really you get higher education you take the path that most people take which makes makes quote unquote makes sense um, and then there's the other path where you take the skills and as critical thinkers as designers it just seems like our natural inclination is to say well where else can these skills be used and so uh, at the age of 22, I decided to sort of venture out into the world with the skills that I had and start to explore how can design and architecture be used in conversations about economic development and about poverty reduction and about social change and about systems change and transformation. Um, and uh, I landed in the creative field, I guess, um, almost by accident. But what you realize is when you interface with all of these different spaces that uh, that they've been waiting for design for, for generations. They've been waiting for designers to come and knock on their door and bring this sort of generative, open, um, emergent process to them. So the Community Design Initiative is a project that I've been involved in for now six years. But when I started my studio, I was 22 and looking for opportunities and got in touch with the city of Toronto, my new home. Um, and they referred me to uh, a department that existed then called Live With Culture. And uh, th the idea was that they were going around to at risk, you know, what were called the priority neighborhoods a number of years ago, communities at risk in Toronto, and offering uh, opportunities for them to create public art in spaces that were underutilized in the community. And so uh, through a series of, you know, uh, kind of funny events, we started a project that invited the, the kids in the community to redesign and rebuild a 10,000 square foot social service delivery hub in the heart of one of the worst 
diverse communities in the country. Uh, one of this community, uh, you know, has issues around marginalization, around uh, local economic development. There's, it's a food desert. I mean, it's got, it's, uh, you know, a lot of the residents, a third of the residents live below the poverty line. Like, you know, it's 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 a community that could could use some attention. And 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 for me, part of the interest I had, and and I studied architecture and international development, was that um, how how do we bring architecture into the places? How do we bring design into the places where it's not usually found? And how do we use design as a mechanism, as a as a, as a conduit um, to learn about economic development and poverty reduction and all these different things? And so over the last five years, what we've done is we've worked with many children. I think it's over 75 kids now um, to help them conceptualize and design and fundraise and build uh, this building, which is. Uh, a place in the community that harnesses, you know, it, it hosts uh, rehabilitation and settlement services and employment programs. And so the kids have actually had to really deeply understand the needs and the nuances in the community to be able to design space. And so in the over the course of the five years that we've worked together, these kids have had a capital A architectural education, at the same time, they've become great designers because they look to people first. They don't, they don't say, I want to, you know, when, they, when we started, you know, the, the running joke was a basketball on the roof all the time, right? <laughs> like, their default, you give kids the chance to design a building, and the first thing they're going to say is basketball court on the roof, apparently. Um, the first thing, the first thing that these youth now know how to do is that they go. We should ho we should host a consultation. And they know how to facilitate a consultation. They know how to host a charrette, which is sort of bringing a bunch of people together to find a solution to a design problem in a short amount of time. And so, over the last five years, uh, they've built 4,000 square feet of this building, uh, raised close to two million dollars, um, and they're now in the fundraising and, and uh, design phase of the final the West the West Wing addition, um, which is sort of the largest part of the expansion project. Uh, and, and what's so interesting is that they respond first to the community, right? So the Community Design Initiative is not a project, it's not a client project of mine. Um, and the, the, community, the community can say um, at any point, uh, this isn't right for us. And so a lot of architects and designers go into communities and do this kind of community development work thinking, you know, oh, we're putting in a development here anyways, so we should really talk to the community about it and see what they think. And if they don't like what we're doing, well, that's too bad. We wish they would. Um, and the development continues. In the case of the Community Design Initiative, if the community says at some point, uh, this isn't right for us, um, the project will stop because it's led by residents and it's it's just been fascinating to see what unfolds when you use design as a mechanism to, to for for empowerment not often are we invited to uh, have a role in our built environment we're passive consumers of the built environment and really in this process what we're trying to do is activate that relationship is trying to trying to tell a six-year-old you know what would you want this to look like, and, and, and who else are you sharing this space with? Those kinds of notions are things that, that, that young people in, in, across all communities, privileged and marginalized, are not, are not being introduced to. And so this project is really the opportunity to say, you have a role in this. And whether it be a young person or a new Canadian or, or a person who lives just down the street in downtown, it's a chance to say, you know, we can all have a role in shaping our built environment, and we should have a role in shaping our built environment. Designers have a particular type of language, and uh, our language is really accessible to us. And we forget that we go when we go out into the world, um, and unlike many disciplines, uh, but designers sort of suffer this a little bit more because we try and we try and get out of our disciplines to engage with. You know, we're we're trained in an inter interdisciplinary uh, approach. So what we have to be really mindful of is the way we use language, and that each community and each um, each different industry that we work with has a particular way of communicating the things that we communicate. One of the biggest things that, that we need to understand when we work in community is are things like risk tolerance um, and aversion to risk and uh, social infrastructure. And those aren't things that we learn in design school. We don't learn about um, the social fabrics that need to exist for change making to happen. The biggest education I've had in the time that I've, I've run my studio, and particularly in the project around the community design initiative, is that you know the co-learning that needs to happen to set a really strong foundation for these projects not to happen and be glory stories, but for these projects to thrive and sustain beyond the time that both of our organizations are involved in them. Um, so for community design to live on, there needs to be a shared language uh, between communities and designers and architects and planners. And so the biggest struggle is building that shared version uh, because we want, we want to introduce our jargon. We want to introduce uh, the, 
the way that we walk in the world because we think it has value. And so, um, so that has been a huge struggle. Um, patience is another struggle. Um, you know, we, we, we want Silver Bullet, we want Nescafe change, and, um, and it, just, it just doesn't happen that way. I've learned to become a little suspect of change that happens fast um, because meaningful long-term change happens at a glacial pace, um, but it's so rewarding, right? So, so I think I think as a as a as a very impatient person, um, learning to be patient with the process and learning to actually trust emergence that. Um, you know, you you design you design a plan for the project, and then you put it aside and hope for the best. And you and you learn you learn to build up an adaptive capacity to say we can still meet the goal that we originally intended to meet, but it's going to look totally different than we expected. Um, and that's the nature of design and innovation in general. In that, uh, you know, you really have to have to build that patience muscle to be able to um, to be resilient and to actually see change through and see projects through. So uh, I would say those are the biggest struggles in building community. Don't go in with a preconceived notion of what this should be. I think part of the challenge of working in community is that it's a, it, it truly challenges the notion of co-design and co-creation. Um, if you go in with a preconceived notion of what this what this community needs, um, without being a part of it, it's you're you're contradicting what you're supposed to be doing as a designer in that community. And so, uh, very often designers, I mean, there's a lot of designers who work in community development, and a lot of them are like, this community needs a school. Um, and so long as that comes from the community, that's a great project. And so the, the biggest tip I would say is just you know is is you know practice the power of listening. And it sounds really cliche, but we don't do it enough as designers because you know we're trained to to observe and generate and so and it's not to say that those observations don't have value what they actually need when it comes to the surface then you can contribute those ideas and then you can contribute those observations you know that being said to sort of suggest and to and to and to provoke and to prompt uh, is not such a bad thing but I, I do think that we need to be really mindful when going into communities to to be responsive to them and not to uh, not to make them passive consumers um, of what of our, of our ideas and so uh, I would say that's the biggest tip I have for for creating community what I find most interesting is that you know as as an educator um, I'm supposed to know a lot right <laughs> so um, what I've found in the t in the years I, I've, I've taught at OCAD actually for for a lot of my formative years which is actually kind of an interesting experience and what I've learned over the years is is you know, to hold that space um, and to wait for people to sort of fill it is something that me as an extrovert and as a facilitator, you're not really used to doing. And so our inclination is to fill the space. Our inclination is to share everything we know. And for those, you know, who have, who have been part of my facilitation or part of my educational workshops or have been students of mine, um, they know that I will give you everything I know really fast and then I will leave the rest of the space for you to fill. And so, you know, when leading, when leading groups and communities, um, it, it's sort of the same thing. The, the, the real challenge is, is to be able to hold the space for them to have ideas that are, you know, bad, for, the, for people to reveal and be vulnerable and for people to um, negotiate with their egos and other people's egos. In many ways, as designers and community, we act as mediators uh, because what we're really trying to do is create the space for people to say, all of the things that come to mind first and not curate themselves. And that's really hard for people to do. It's really hard for us to do. And so um, in leading a group of people, you know, my, my, my number one rule is can we bypass ego? Can we build a, a space of trust? And can we, can we let go of every notion of good that we are attached to and try something new just because it might lead us somewhere that we've never been? Mm -hmm. I run a studio called Architect and it's a design think tank and consultancy and, and our premise is that we bring design to places where it's not usually found. Sometimes that is in community, sometimes that's in large uh, charitable organizations or corporations or, or even small community groups um, or social enterprises and part of what we've seen is when I started the organization it was you know I, I was elbowing down doors to try and have people talk about hey maybe design could be useful here I know you haven't really you think of me as someone who creates artifacts, but maybe I could show you how I could change your process, how I could change your system, how I could understand why people aren't buying your product or why people aren't engaging in the services you want to offer, which is a really, really great thing for people to wrap their minds around, the idea that designers are systems changers. And so when I started the studio, it was elbowing down doors. And as I approach doors now, the, the doors are already sort of, they're cracked open a little bit. 
What's next for us as a studio is to really look at some big systems. We have had so much experience working on the ground, front line with groups of all sorts, engaging with, you know, you name it, we've, we've engaged with them. And so our goal is to really, I mean, look at the bigger systems now. So, uh, you know, one of our particular fascinations right now is how good ideas get support. And uh, we're working with a, a, a a public foundation here in, in Canada to sort of re-envision how they give out grants. Uh, so how do people who really want to make change happen, how do they actually get money, and how is that process more human-centered? Um, and so some of these systems are so entrenched, right? We, we look at systems like education, and we look at systems like social services, and they're so entrenched because, for the most part, they work. But are they actually considering their users, or are they considering the efficiency of the system? Um, and because we built trust as a studio, we built trust uh, across the sectors, public, private, and charitable, we're now looking at what experiments, what are the next experiments that we can do, and can they be a little bit more more broad reaching um, and I, I, I hesitate to say bigger because you know in the in the culture of right now scale is everything and we're not about more we're just about broad we want to go wider so you can find us at uh, architectsinc.com um, and our twitter is at architects and my twitter is at zara eb so uh, you can find me there thanks for joining us on canadian creatives for the show notes, links mentioned, and more episodes, be sure to visit CanadianCreatives.ca. Follow at now Creates and at now Digital Net on Twitter for updates. Canadian Creatives is a Now Digital Network series presented by Now Creative Group. For design, digital, marketing, and media services, visit NowCreativeGroup.com.